Hello, everyone. Welcome to Maria Vision and a new program we're beginning tonight. You're on the cutting edge here. So the program is called Praying the Bible. So this will be every week, Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Join us for Praying the Bible. Our theme uh, for tonight is a new beginning with the word. So what we're going to do in this program is uh, work through the Bible and read passages from Bible from the Bible in light of prayer, what it teaches us about prayer, what it teaches us about the spiritual life, how, for instance, the saints and mystics have used certain pages, certain texts from the scripture to talk about the life of prayer. In short, we will, we will be praying the Bible. I think our own time, and I'm Father Ignatius Schweitzer, before I run into things, get started here. Father Ignatius Schweitzer, priest from St. Catherine of Siena, Priory in New York City. I got to know uh, the good people at Maria Vision uh, last summer in Ave Maria, Florida. I did a retreat there, uh, some others, and so it's great to, to be back and to be back in Ave Maria in spirit, if not there uh, present in body. So, um, yeah, so I think we, many Catholics haven't really appreciated the power that we have in the scriptures, the inspired word of God. This is something that has struck me recently in my own prayer life with the Bible. Um, and so this is going to sort of open up, this program week after week is going to open us into how we should pray the Bible, how we can get the most out of the inspired word of God in our life of prayer. I have more to say about this as we get going, but let's start with prayer. We'll turn to our Blessed Mother first, Mother of the Word. I don't know if you know about the apparitions in Cabejo, Africa of Our Lady, but she revealed herself as the Mother of the Word, which I think is a beautiful title for Our Lady. And she has, she bore the Word made flesh in her womb. She bore the Word made flesh in her arms as a little baby. And first of all, she bore the word in her heart. As St. Augustine reminds us, Mary conceived first through her faith and her soul before she conceived in her womb. She kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. She'll be the one who teaches us how to pray the word, how to pray the Bible. We we'll turn to her first. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Gracious God and Father, we thank you for speaking your word to us. We thank you that you still speak a fresh word to us in the depths of our heart as we read the scriptures. Open us, Father, to the word you speak to us, that anointed word that comes with the life and power of the Holy Spirit. Open us, Father, to hear your word with the ears of our heart. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So pray in the Bible. And I, I've been excited recently about uh, the Word of God and thinking through a theology of the Word of God. How is it that the power of the Word comes to us today? How is it that we can best read the Bible to open ourselves to the Word of God that's living and effective, as the letter to the Hebrew says? And I've been doing these midday retreat with the mystics here in New York City. And so I've been reading a, a lot of the mystics and some of the more, some of the medieval saints and mystics that I've been reading, I've been gleaning from them the way they read the Bible. And I think they read it in a way different than most of us read it today. So I've been reading, um, getting into people like William of St. Thierry. He was a Cistercian from the 1100s, best friend of St. Bernard. 
St. Bernard of Clairvaux is another one who has a powerful theology of the word and how reading the scriptures transforms our souls, how it brings us into deep contact with the Lord. Most recently, I've been reading a lot of John Towler, a 14th century Dominican, part of the Rhineland mystics, as they're called. He has an oh, amazing theology of the word and how the word brings us to new birth. So getting into some of these texts, is just struck, struck me that I want to read the Bible like they do. I'm missing something in my own way of reading the Bible and praying with the Bible. So they've opened me up to kind of new avenues uh, to um, a new encounter with the Word of God through the Scriptures and understanding basically a theology of the Word. So as you may know, you know, if you're a teacher, you teach best what you're excited about. If you're a witness to the Lord Jesus, you witness to him best when you're excited about him, what he's doing in your life. So basically this program, I'm taking you along for the ride in my own journey uh, with the word of God and some new uh, vistas that have opened up recently. So this program, part of the program, we are gonna just talk about how the saints read the Bible, how they approached it. We're going to talk about how the church fathers, how they thought about the Bible and reading the Bible. And we're going to learn from them and the, the monks of the Middle Ages, how they read the Bible. And so part of the program each week, I'll you know take a line or two from one of these saints that gives us an insight into how they prayed the Bible. And that will kind of help us to renew our approach to the Bible and help us to understand how we want to approach it. So every program, you know, I'll draw in somebody, you know, maybe St. Gregory the Great, and we'll talk a little bit about how, how he prayed the Bible. We'll learn from him. That'll be part of the program. The other part will be actually diving into the Word together and reading passages. And I will open them up in terms of what they say about our life of prayer, what they say about our spiritual life, how the saints and mystics use this particular passage in their writings. Because this is something that I think we need to get over, or something we need to learn, is that sometimes people act like you start with Scripture and you get a basic understanding of the faith, like, you know, Scriptures for beginners to give you a basic grasp of the Christian faith. But if you really want to go deep, then you go to the mystics and the saints, and you read Teresa of Avila, you read John of the Cross, if you really want to go far. I think that's a pretty common understanding. But in fact, the actual reality is that you can't go deeper than the Word of God. You can't go higher. You can't have a more sublime contact with God than through the very Word He speaks to us. You know, 2 Timothy 3.16 says about the Scriptures that they're, they're God-breathed. The inspired Word of God, it's God-breathed. God so you can't go deeper or higher or more sublime uh, than the scriptures. So it's not like, okay, scriptures are the basic, and then you go to the mystics. No, it's rather that the mystics help us to understand the full depths of the Word of God. The mystics and saints help us to appreciate um, the sublime realities that are in the sacred page, in the Word of God. They help us to understand scripture. So think about Ephesians chapter 3, the end of the chapter. St. Paul talks about uh, to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowing, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Now, if we're reading that text on our own, we're like, you know, we read that, we're like, okay, filled with the fullness of God, and then we just like keep reading. But how much is contained in those words <laughs> to be filled with the fullness of God? And to really appreciate what it means to be filled with the fullness of God, to truly understand that passage, Ephesians 3, 18, 19, and 20, to really understand that passage, you need to read Teresa of Avila, Interior Castles. You need to read John of the Cross, Living Flame of Love. You need to read the, the saints and mystics as they talk about what it is to be filled with the fullness of God. Right? So the mystics aren't something like beyond Scripture. We need the saints and mystics to understand Scripture itself in their depths. St. Jerome beautifully said about scripture that 
scripture is shallow enough, you know, think about going into a pool of water. You can enter the shallow side of the pool and scripture is shallow enough that, you know, simple beginners can find sustenance in the scriptures. But on the other hand, for the spiritually advanced scripture, the scriptures are so deep that you never bottom out. And so in God's beautiful, tender love for us, he meets us where we are. And he, he feeds the little ones. He feeds the mystics. Uh, he takes us deeper into his word, and, and we never bottom out. So we want to read the scriptures in a way that open us to that great depth that we can never bottom out on. And to, to drink from the scriptures. An early monastic rule spoke speaks about the word of God and the scriptures stirring up our fervor. And it speaks about drinking salvation from the sacred scriptures. That's what we want to be about as we read the word of God. We want to drink salvation through the sacred scriptures. Jesus says in John 17, 3, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That knowing of God, that intimate, loving knowing of God is eternal life, what we call the beatific vision in heaven. But we get a foretaste of that through the scriptures. God manifests, he reveals himself to us through the word of God. And so we get a foretaste of eternal life. We drink salvation through the sacred scriptures as we ponder the scriptures, as we contemplate, as we meditate. Uh, on the sacred page, we drink salvation from it. A knowing and loving of God is stirred up in our souls through the Bible. So that's the way we want to read sacred scripture. That's what we'll, we'll be doing here. So to understand the Bible, to go deep, we need, we need the saints and mystics to do that. And in fact... That's been the Catholic way of reading the scriptures, right? It's not sola scriptura, scripture alone. It's scripture and tradition. And scripture and tradition means, okay, you have tradition, you have the church councils that help us read the scriptures and understand them and keep us on the path. But reading the Bible with the tradition also means reading it with the saints, how the saints took in these words, how they pondered and reflected on the words of scripture. And so to get to the depths of the scriptures, we need the saints as well. We need this living tradition that comes to us through the teachings of the saints who are still alive. Right? God is God of the living. No one's dead to him. They're all alive to him. They're alive to us. And to read the scriptures, the word of God, among those living voices, and also to read it in the context of the liturgy, word and sacrament. The natural habitat of the Bible is the liturgy. That's its proper environment. That's where the Gospels, you know, were formed. You know, there was a time in the early church where there was no Bible. It was simply oral tradition and the liturgy and passing on. And then as uh, the traditions about Jesus get passed on, they get gathered together in collections of writings as they're proclaimed in the liturgy, the Mass the Lord's Supper, and then over time, you know, over decades, um, then we come to have the Gospels, the four Gospels, and the writings of St. Paul and the whole New Testament. So that is the natural habitat of Scripture. It's the liturgy. That's when the Word comes to us with power, especially as we take in the written Word and as we receive the Word made flesh in the Eucharist. Christ's true body, blood, soul, and divinity. So as Catholics, we get to read the Bible in that rich context, and we need to open ourselves more and more to this. So part of this program will be kind of looking into that and how we open ourselves to that and how we go deep. But then the other part of the program uh, will be reading the Bible uh, with, you know, an eye to insights into the spiritual life and prayer. So we're going to start with the Gospel of John. Beautiful place to start. Um, where we'll go from there, we'll see. Maybe Isaiah uh, chapters 40 to 66, but we'll see. One step at a time. 
And at first I thought, okay, maybe we'll do a chapter a week through the Gospel of John. Um, but I'm guessing we probably won't make it through a whole chapter each week. Uh, we have the prologue of Gospel of John to look at tonight, and that'll probably take a little while because it's so rich. So we'll, we'll work through the Gospel of John week after week, um, maybe about half a chapter per week, but we'll see how it goes. And so I really encourage you to read along. Take out your Bible as you're listening and read along in the sacred page with me. If you're looking for a good, good Bible, there's an English Standard Version is the one that I'll be using. English Standard Version. And Augustine Institute uh, published a nice edition of it. So you get also the all the Catholic books of the Bible with this edition from the Augustine Institute. Um, so read along, and you know, in the days between our coming together in this program, continue to read the Gospel of John. Open your, your hearts to what the Lord is doing. Um, and yeah, we'll press on through the Bible this way. Week after week, we'll, we'll continue to go deeper. I, I want to just share, um, let's just to kind of fill out, um, just to say a little bit more about how the church reads the Bible. Let me just read a, a little bit to you, and I'll share my screen with you so you can see it. Um, a little bit from uh, the Second Vatican Council on Divine Revelation. So you know, a very powerful document from the Second Vatican Council is called Dei Verbum. And that's Latin for the Word of God. And it's about divine revelation. And that's so important for us today, especially because people can tend to, oh, how do I know about God? Well, it's because my feelings about God. We don't trust in the word of God. We don't trust in divine revelation as truth coming from God himself. Ralph Martin has pointed this out quite a bit, that one of our, our problems in, our, in the church in the world today is a lack of trust in the inspired word of God. We don't take it as, as truth coming from the, the mouth of God. That's more true than anything we can come up with. So we need to submit to it in faith. So, you know, just uh, one example to, to show this, let's think about the question of um, eternal salvation and eternal damnation. Right, if you talk about most to most people today about, do you think anyone will end up in hell? You know, people just go by what they feel. They were like, oh, well, you know, God could have sent anyone to hell, that kind of thing. Um, and it's like they're trusting in their own judgment. But if you open up the word of God, divine revelation, you see God himself speaking to us about the, this great chasm between heaven and hell, a great decision that's made in this life. Do you choose Christ or not? Those who are in the sun have life. Those who are not don't. And so the inspired word of God tells us the truth of the matter about hell, but people aren't willing to accept it because they trust their own judgment more. All right, so just one, one little example and how people don't have trust in the inspired word of God and they, they follow their own sense of things when God has spoken the truth to us. Okay, but you know, it, it, the problem goes, it goes broader than that. But yeah, we need tr faith in the inspired word of God. So here's, I'll just read a paragraph from Dave Verbum, um, the Second Vatican Council's document. Uh, on divine revelation. Okay. Let me just zoom in a little closer and see it. Uh, oh, well. oh, no, I can't figure. Okay, so uh, this is day variable number eight. Sorry. It's, okay. Okay, hopefully you can you can see that better. Okay, day of Rebel number eight. And so the apostolic preaching, which is expressed in a special way in the inspired books, was to be preserved by an unending succession of preachers until the end of time. Therefore, the apostles, handing on what they themselves had received, warn the faithful to hold fast to the traditions which they have learned, either by word of mouth or by letter, and to fight in defense of the faith handed once on, once for all, 
Now, what was handed on by the apostle, you know, so this is, again, sola scriptura, it's scripture and tradition, a living tradition. Now, what was handed on by the apostles includes everything which contributes toward the holiness of life and increase in faith of the peoples of God. And so the church and her teaching, life and worship, perpetuates and hands on to all generations all that she herself is, all that she believes. Right, so the living tradition that the church hands on is not simply like a list of doctrine. It's not simply creedal statements. It is that, it includes that. But what the church hands on is also something living. We hand on a living relationship with the Lord Jesus. The liturgy is one key way that the church hands on the deposit of faith, what the apostles received at the time of Jesus. And so you're handing on the living relationship with the Lord, and the living tradition includes all of that. So as we hand on the Word of God, it's in this context of the church's liturgy and the whole life of the church. Okay, and I'll just read this one more paragraph. We'll save the rest for some other time. This tradition, which comes from the apostles, develops in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit. Right, the Holy Spirit is what makes this text living and active in our lives today and applies it to us personally and anoints the word so it bears fruit in our life and it brings us into deep contact with God. Uh, the text continues, for there is a growth in the understanding of the realities and the words which have been handed on. This happens through the contemplation and study made by believers who treasure these things in their hearts, just like Mary did. Through a penetrating understanding of the spiritual realities which they experience. And through the preaching of those who have received through Episcopal succession the sure gift of truth. For as the centuries succeed one another, the church constantly moves forward towards the fullness of divine truth until the words of God reach their complete fulfillment in her. So I just want to highlight here uh, that the, the word of God and our taking it in is aided by contemplation. The word of God is not to, just to get doctrine, although that's part of it. It's not just to get information. Uh, it's to help us to contemplate, to enter into contemplation, profound contact with the Lord, loving union with God. As we treasure these things in our hearts, like Mary did, through a penetrating understanding of the spiritual realities which they experience. So the very realities that the Bible speaks about, we experience. It's an experiential knowledge of these mysteries. So for instance, Consider, you know, we're approaching Lent here next week, um, and consider Israel's time in the desert, that time of, test, of testing in the desert. So you can read Exodus about Israel's testing in the desert. But when we find ourselves in a similar time of testing, these passages from Exodus then become living realities to us, an experiential reality to us. We, too, experience the thirst in the desert, the thirst for God. We, too, draw away from civilization, from Facebook, from technology, into the desert. Uh, the text of the, the scriptures comes alive, and we have an experiential knowledge of these truths. As our heart is purified for God, um, it reflects what happens to Israel in the sacred page in Exodus. Um, or when St. Paul in Ephesians talks about that we might know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowing, so that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Through the inspired word of God, we come to experience that, being filled with the fullness of God. The very reality that the scriptures describe, we experience, is made alive in us through the Holy, Holy Spirit. When we approach the Bible in prayer, and contemplation. So there's a rich tasting, a rich drinking of salvation from the sacred page, to use the words of that monastic rule. A real tasting and experiencing of God's salvation as it comes to us through the inspired Word of God, through the Eucharist, through the liturgy, all this kind of brought together. 
But yeah, this word of God, it's, it has power inherent within it. Okay, so that's something about this experiential knowledge that we have through the scriptures, treasuring in our heart. So we want to read the Bible in a way that uh, opens us to deep contemplation. Okay. So again, at the beginning of each program, we'll, we'll do little reflections like this. Think about what, you know, like St. Bernard said about this, or what uh, William of St. Thierry, or what Gregory the Great says about reading the scripture. Um, but I mean, so I just one more thing on just this experiential knowledge of God through the scriptures. So this is from St. John Paul II. Um, Donum et Mysterium. I think it's an apostolic letter. And he says, the minister of the word, and we, you know, we could put here any reader of the word, the minister of the word must possess and pass on that knowledge of God, which is not a mere deposit of doctrinal truths, but a personal living experience of the mystery. All right, a personal living experience of the mystery. That's what we hand on. That's what uh, you parents out there hand on to children. That's what um, you evangelists out there hand on to your coworkers and people you're bringing closer to the Lord. Um, now, doctrinal truths are involved in that. John Paul II certainly isn't <laughs> denying that. We need the doctrine, um, but we don't want the doctrine to be a dead letter. We want it to be a, a living mystery that we're handing on. So the minister of the word must possess, right? So we must experience it ourselves first, the mystery of God, if we're going to hand it on to others in a convincing, persuasive way. The minister of the word must possess and pass on that knowledge of God, which is not a mere deposit of doctrinal truths, but a personal living experience of the mystery. Whew. You know, that's what we want, like what the Bible describes. We want a personal living experience of that mystery. And we, we can have it as we pray the Bible, as we pray the Bible, as we enter into the Eucharistic Adoration Chapel and we open up the Bible and we sit with these passages, uh, we, we mold them over in our minds and hearts. We treasure up all these things in our hearts. And it brings us to this place that John Paul II is describing. Then we'll be effective witnesses to the world today. Right, the world is hungry for God. The, the world is, is, is hungry for a living encounter with God. So we need that first of all enabled to, to in order to be able to hand that on to them. And through the word of God, we have that. Okay. So um to the gospel of John, a little more proper, kind of getting into it. I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons I chose to start with the gospel of John is because. The depths of the word of God really hit us in a powerful way uh, through this gospel. And the union of the word of God with the sacraments of the church really come together in a powerful way in this gospel. The gospel of John is very sacramental. I mean, on a couple levels. I mean, on one level, all scripture is sacramental, lowercase s. You know, the definition of a sacrament is a visible means of an invisible grace. And so the scriptures, okay, it's not a seven, it's not one of the seven sacraments, but it's sacramental. The scripture too, the Bible too, is a visible uh, means of communicating invisible grace. And so too, there's a sacramental quality to it. We come into real contact with God through the, the words of scripture. But the gospel of John too is also very sacramental in terms of the seven sacraments. Think of John chapter three. To be born again must be born of water and the spirit, connection to baptism, and that baptismal spirituality, which we still live out today. So, you know, baptism just isn't about when you were baptized as an infant. It's a reality that continues to bear grace and fruit in your life today. Uh, the Gospel of John is very sacramental. So think about uh, John chapter 6 in the Eucharist, uh, the strong words about eating Christ's uh, true body and blood in the gospel of John chapter six and in some other ways. So you get a rich sense of the, the sacramental life of the church 
uh, as is expressed in the Gospel of John. You know, one time I went through an airport uh, through security and, you know, I put my bag on the conveyor belt. It goes through uh, the x-ray machines. Hope it comes out on the other end and, you know, thankfully it does. And uh, the guard is like talking to me um, and he, you know, he sees I'm, I'm a priest and he says, oh, you know, Father, uh, what, what's your favorite book in the Bible? And, you know, I kind of gather that he's, he must, yeah, I think he's a Baptist or kind of an evangelical Protestant. Um, I kind of sense that about uh, just the way he's talking. And um, so he asked, yeah, what's your favorite book in the Bible? And I, I think for a moment and I say, oh, uh, the Gospel of John. And he said, you Catholic priests always say that. <laughs> so I guess it's something of a survey that he conducted as a pastime as he's working in the airport. Uh, you know, when you see people walk by, yeah, what's your, what's your favorite book of the Bible? So it's kind of keeping a tally of things. And yeah, Catholic priests tend to say the Gospel of John is their favorite book of the Bible. And it makes sense. There, there, there's a depth to the Gospel of John. There, there's a way in which the Gospel of John opens us up to contemplative prayer, deep prayer, in a, a, a privileged way. Think about the last discourse of John, John 14 through 17. Ah. Oh, uh, just just the depths of Jesus' love for us coming out and how we commune with him in intimacy. And we're going to have to spend a lot of time with John 14 through 17. Um, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And we see the mystics drawing from those passages. So John 14, 21 and John 14, 23, uh, which speak about Jesus manifesting himself to us. And I will love you and manifest myself to you, Jesus says, John 14, 21. What's this manifestation of Jesus to us? It's him showing himself to us in contemplative prayer, bringing us beyond words and concepts into a deeper encounter with the mystery of, of who he is in himself. You know, you're in the adoration chapel and you just get struck with the awestruck wonder about the majesty of God. That's him showing himself to you. That's Jesus fulfilling his promise, and I will love you and manifest myself to you. Yes, I have a sense of your love, Lord, I hadn't had when I entered into the chapel. And I can't produce on my own because it's you manifesting yourself to us. And so the Bible helps us to encounter that. In John 14, 23, the mystics love to turn to as well, which speaks about the indwelling Trinity. And we will come to him and make our home with him. So these, these are rich, rich pages uh, in the Bible, the Gospel of John. And we have to, to understand the Gospel of John. You know, it can help to read the scripture scholarship. And, you know, I'll bring to this program as we study the Bible the best of the scriptural scholarship. But you don't want to get stuck there. You don't want to, you know, okay, you know, Ray, Raymond Brown or somebody can have an insight here or there into the scriptures. But you don't want to get stuck there. You want to go deeper. You want to go deeper. And that's been a crisis. That's part of the crisis in us reading the Bible in a more profound way is we have kind of have got caught up in the historical critical method uh, as a whole. Uh, Benedict the 16th, you know, is big on this. His Jesus of Nazareth series um, kind of brings the best of the historical scholarship to bear, but then brings um, it into con conversation with the spiritual life, how it's helpful for us, how it helps us encounter the Lord. Um, so anyway, so that, that is some of the context for why um, the way Catholics tend to read the Bible today is a little flat. It, it doesn't reach the depths often that the, the monks of the Middle Ages encountered there. So to really appreciate the Gospel of John, we need to be like the beloved disciple. So Origen, so he's one of the earliest Catholic Christian theologians, uh, one of the earliest scripture exegetes, and reading the Bible like the church fathers did in a rich way. And Origen, in his Gospel on John, his commentary on the Gospel of John, begins by saying to really understand the Gospel of John, we need to be like the beloved disciple. And we need to lay our heads on the heart of Jesus and take Mary as our mother. Right, so that that's this church father who, um, you know, lives from I think he, he 184 uh, around that time, um, and 
already we see a strong Mary in spirituality. You want to understand the Gospel of John? You have to take Mary as your mother. You know, hearkening to John 19, Jesus dies on the cross, and he says to the beloved disciple, Behold your mother. He says to Mary, Behold your son. And he took her into his own home. He took her into himself. And if you want to understand the depths of the Gospel of John, you have to take Mary as your mother into your heart, like the beloved disciple. John the Evangelist refers to himself as the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John for a number of reasons, but one is so that we see ourselves in the pages of the Gospel of John. We are another beloved disciple. So we have to take Mary into our heart. Jesus gave her to us as well at the cross. We do that uh, in prayer. Uh, then, we'll, then we'll come to understand that the Gospel of John. So Origen says, to understand this gospel, you have to lay your head on the heart of Jesus and take Mary as your mother. So laying your head on the heart of Jesus, of course, refers to the Last Supper and the beloved disciple resting on the heart of Jesus. And we need to read the Gospel of John while resting on the heart of Jesus. And Eucharistic adoration, abiding with the Lord and taking his words into your heart, uh, taking these words of the Gospel of John into your heart. Um, so it's rich fare that we're entering into, and we're, we're going to approach it in a way that uh, expands our hearts and brings us deep. So the prologue of the Gospel of John. Please open up your Bible. I know you, you all are good Catholics out there, so you have the Bible handy all right, next to you. I have a little pocket Bible, so it's always nice to have the Word of God. Uh, with you, you're waiting in line or something, waiting in the dentist, you can just crack open your Bible, read a few verses. God speaks to us through the Bible. He still does today. He touches our heart, renews us through the Bible. Um, do not conform any long to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, Romans 12, 2. And the Bible is part of that transformation that takes place through the renewal of the mind. So we got to become more and more men and women of the word. So the prologue of the Gospel of John, rich fare, 18 verses long. Uh, as you know, uh, the Christmas midday mass, the main, the gospel for the day is uh, the prologue of the Gospel of John. As you know, probably in the old rite of the mass, the prologue of the Gospel of John was read after every mass. So it's a, a text that's rich in the life of the church that's used a lot. Um, you might not know this, but also in early exorcisms and deliverance prayer, it was common for the priest to pray the prologue of John over the person struggling with demonic possession or oppression because there's power in the word to drive away the enemy. There's a beautiful book called The Way of the, the Pilgrim. And it says in there at some point, um, you know, if you don't understand what you're reading in the Bible, keep reading it. Because even if you don't understand, the devils understand and they flee. And that's the power of the word of God, the word. Um, even if we don't understand, they still have power to drive away the enemy. Uh, so the prologue of John was, was used in exorcisms, early deliverance prayer. And so it just shows the potency of the word and uh, the place of this text in the life of the church. The prologue of John is kind of a summary of the whole gospel of John. You can find themes throughout the gospel reflected that you know, stated already here in the prologue. So, if, you know, I, I recommend scripture memory to memorize some scripture passages. You know, I mean, you might start with the verse or two. Uh, pray always, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Um, Come to me, all you who labor and heavy burden, I will give you rest, uh, Matthew chapter 11. Anyways, but if you really get into scripture memory, you know, memorize the prologue of the Gospel of John. I, I've done that, and it's so when I go to bed, I, I recite to myself the prologue of the Gospel of John. So, then, yeah, it's beautiful to fall asleep as you're reciting the Word of God. 
as you've just taken in the prologue of God, <laughs> the prologue of God, it is on that too, the prologue of John, uh, as it's still fresh in your mind and heart to drift off into sleep. Um, yeah, so to have, have God's spoken word uh, alive in us uh, today, just, I'm just recommending different ways we can do that. So yeah, the prologue of John, uh, rich text. So let's let's just dive into uh, the first line here. First uh, paragraph, read along. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the beginning, it's good to return to that beginning point. In the beginning, from all eternity, God the Father has spoken his word. He has given birth to his son, the eternal generation of the son, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. From all eternity, the Son is born of the Father in the communion of the Holy Spirit. From all eternity, the Father speaks this word, this anointed word, this word anointed with the Holy Spirit in that communion of love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Eternity is not so much unending time. Eternity is present. So in God's eternity, every moment is present. It's the gathering up into one moment in God's eternity of, of all moments scattered throughout history after God creates. St. Thomas Aquinas has a beautiful phrase for that. The nunc stans in Latin. Nunc stans, the standing now. The now stands forever in God's life and his eternity. And so as the, the son is being begotten of the father, you know, which happens, it's been happening forever. There wasn't a time when the son was not. The son is co-eternal with the father. He's always been generating the son. And in that generation of the son, God knows all that's going to happen after he creates. It's all present to him. And so there's something of our being adopted as sons and daughters uh, that, that's in there, that's in that moment of the Son breaking forth from the heart of the Father in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Our adoption as sons and da daughters of God is mirrored, is a reflection of the Son's being begotten of the Father from all eternity. Right? We're not divine like the Son. It's, it's by grace. It's a participation in the life of, of the Son, but it's modeled after this eternal begetting of the Son from the Father. And so in our life of prayer, to sit with this passage, the prologue of John, and enter again into that beginning, that freshness, that newness of grace, breaking forth as if for the first time, to be renewed there, and that new birth that God wants to give us uh, even now uh, through his son. So it's a powerful place of prayer. You know, think about midnight mass on Christmas Eve and um, that entrance antiphon to midnight mass. Um, in eternal ages, uh, in the morning star, you have begotten me. And so in kind of that darkness, that fresh beginning, to find our places there again and to be renewed in the Son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, obviously this is happening in eternity before we were <laughs> created, uh, but it's a place that we can enter into and be renewed. Because the thing with eternity is, okay, this has been happening from eternal past, God the Father begetting the Word, the Son, but it's also happening in the present moment as if for the first time. That's the way eternity works. 
And so to enter into that new beginning where all our worries, all our anxieties, whatever is burdening your mind and heart right now, shake it off when you enter into prayer. Get a fresh start. Be renewed in the Lord. Go back to that place uh, before you were created, so to speak. Where that place where it's all God, all love, all communion. And that's the place we're going to end up, God willing. We make it to heaven. That place of perfect communion with God. And everything between those two points is like a, a snap of the fingers. It's, it's, it's time passing by quickly. This is our true home, this place of communion, the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we should enter there. And in prayer, we're allowed to enter there and use these texts, which mediate that reality to us. You know, sacramental, they, they bring that reality to us of God, the word breaking forth from God, the, 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 the Father, in all love, all life, all communion. It's a resting place for us. Then that refreshes us, and we're renewed to face the difficulties of life. The same concerns that you surrendered as you enter the chapel and you enter this place, now you leave the chapel and you're, you're ready to face those concerns. But from God's perspective, from a way in which you're renewed and you're not trapped by these things, you've risen above them, and you can bring a new life, new peace, and new joy into these things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So, you know, I've, I've jumped ahead and kind of seen these things in terms of our participation in this. But, you know, this is speaking of God himself as well. It reveals to us who God is. God is not a solitary God. The one God enjoys the communion of love within himself. The Father speaks the word. And if you want to find the Holy Spirit in this passage... Find it in that short little word, that preposition, with. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And, you know, think of God the Father here when you see the word God here. The word was with the Father. That with, that connecting, that communio, that with is the Holy Spirit. That's St. Augustine's, one of his favorite ways to refer to the Holy Spirit as communio, the communion of love, the bond of love, uh, St. Augustine calls the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is here in that passage, in that with, uh, that, that short little uh, proposition. And in, in the Greek, it's actually pros. It has, has a notion of like movement towards. The word was towards the Father. He was turning back to the Father, leaning on the Father as the Father leans towards him and begets him. And the Holy Spirit is that connection between them, that union of love they share, that communio. That's God. That's the God we love. That's the God we fall before and say, holy, holy, holy. That's the God we enter into deeper relationship uh, through this word spoken to us. And to think about any word we speak mirrors something of the second person of the Trinity. I mean, you know, God could have created um, creation to be whatever he wanted. But he, choose, he chose to have us speak words because it shows us something about his son. It shows us something about the second person of the Trinity, the son of the father. And words are so powerful, right? If I speak words to you, it's like I'm telling you what's in my interiority. And you receive into your interiority my interiority. If I sketch something out with my words and you're, you come into like agreement with me, sympathy with me, our hearts are united in that word. The words I speak to you, you let, you let my interiority get inside your interiority. That's the power of even just the human spoken word. When it's profound and when it's received, the speaker's my interiority gets into your interiority and we enjoy a communion. That's just the human word. Now, God's word, it's all the more profound. As he speaks the word to us in the scriptures, we let God's interiority into our interiority by receiving his word. Right? In God's word, he tells us what he's thinking. He tells us the way he sees things, how he perceives things, what he loves, what he hates. Uh, he, gives, he lets us into his interiority. 
the word he speaks to us in the word of God uh, brings with it the interiority of God, his inner life. So we can let it into our inner life and be in communion with him and that deep intimacy. We can share in that pros, that with, that preposition, uh, that linking, which is the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you do speak to us, that your word um, enters our heart. Help us, Holy Spirit, to receive the word of the Father in that communion of love. Help us to live this life, this new life of grace, and help us to share this life with others as we share the light of the gospel with others. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll see you next week as we continue our journey uh, through the Gospel of John.